What's up, students? Hope you're having the best day of your life today. So this pop up about a day or so ago, uh, 2020 exam sample questions. This one's for AP Physics 1. So I want to go through it. Um, I'm going to go through it. Pretty much this is going to be my first glance at it. I kind of want to do that so I can show you how long it should take you. Like if you have a pretty good idea, obviously I have a pretty good idea what's going on. So I kind of want to give you a little bit of a time reference as well because I know that's a major major concern as far as time is concerned. Also to a quick disclaimer guys, because I haven't seen this yet, there is a chance I might make an error. Be my eyes and ears out there. If you see I made an error or you think I made an error, just leave it in the comments below. I'll justify my answer. Pretty confident I should get every single one right, but just in case. All right, so let's dive right into it. We'll look at it together and I'll go through exactly what my train of thought would be when answering these questions. So this particular question here is a QQT question, all right? It's designed to be 25 minutes long, and then you're going to have a plus five minutes to submit. If you've not gone on their website and looked at all of the ways they told you how to do it, their instructions have been very, very clear. So having trouble uploading and doing things like that, that's not really going to be an excuse. They've given many, many different resources. you got to get over to their website and even their YouTube channel uh, for more further instructions on how to do stuff. So essentially what happens is we have a small sphere, mass M, suspended by a string with length L. The sphere is making a horizontal circle with radius R at a constant speed. Good news. As shown above, the vertical circle is labeled. Uh, the middle of that circle is labeled with point C, and the string makes an angle theta. Okay, cool. So let's dive into it and see exactly what they want us to solve. All right, so it looks like in the first part, we're going to have two students discussing the motion of the sphere, okay? Student one, none of the forces exerted on the sphere are in the direction of point C. I don't really like that, the circular path. Therefore, I don't see how there could be a centripetal force exerted on the sphere to make its own move in a circle. Okay, that's not correct, but let's see what else it says. Student two, I see, a pro I see another problem. The tension force exerted by the sphere. Uh, string is at an angle from the vertical. That's correct. Therefore, its vertical component must be less than the weight mg of the sphere. That means the net force on the sphere has a downward vertical component and the sphere would move downward as it was moving in a circle. Also, not entirely correct, which is what we see in A and B. What is one aspect of student one which is incorrect? Explain. And what is one aspect of student two? Explain. Now, Guys, when I'm looking at this, the first thing I say is I'm going to need two parts to each of these answers. I need to list what was incorrect. That's going to be the first part of my answer. And then I'm going to explain. So make sure that you put in both. Now, some misconceptions about FC is that it's a separate force. It's an additional force or it has to be a single force. That's not true. It's Remember, guys, it is a net force. And it also can be the component of another force that causes it. So I see in this one, I... They're, this student here is looking for a separate FC. So I think that that's one thing that's incorrect. So this is the first, this is the thing that is incorrect. The student thinks that FC must come from its own separate force and that like that force must be labeled FC. Now I'm going to explain why there still could be one though, even though there's no separate force. So I'm going to justify why it's wrong. The horizontal component of the tension is towards the center. So if I draw that real quick, as we have the horizontal component F tension x, that is what's going to be equal to fc. So in the second part, first, what did the student say that was incorrect? That the vertical component had to be less than mg. Okay, now I need to explain why that is incorrect. Well, it's said that it's moving in a horizontal path. So if that's the case, there's no up and down motion, no motion in the y direction. Okay, so that means that f net in the y direction equals zero. And the forces that are acting in this direction, F net in the y direction, is going to be equal to mg minus the force of tension's y component. So we actually see that mg must be equal to the vertical component of tension. So that is the explanation of why that student statement is incorrect. Student three correctly, so that's good news. That means that we can use these because they tell us that they are correct. So they use these two formulas to relate tension and the F net and other qualities. Explain how one of these equations can be used to challenge student one's claim and the other one to show that it could be used to challenge students two claim. Okay, so let's look at this first one here. If I draw this sphere, I'm going to have R and I'm going to have L. But I can also label this the force of tension and this is the force of tension X where this is theta. 
So using trig, I can see that FTX equals the sine of theta FT. But now I want to put it in terms that they've given. They say that the sine of theta equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. So the sine of theta really is R over L. So I could take this in and substitute it and say that the, the component of tension that's in the X direction is really the force of tension times R over L. So by showing that there is a uh, horizontal component, we know there's an FC, and it turns out that that FC is exactly that F net, and F net inward is called FC. Now I can use the same exact strategy for the Y component to prove that this can challenge student two's claim. Once again, they've put it in terms like this for us. But now how would we call this distance right here? Well, we say A squared plus B squared equals C squared. We'll call this A. So e, A squared plus R squared equals L squared. So A is really the square root of L squared minus R squared. Well, now let's put it in physics terms. This component here, FTY, which is the one in question, has to be equal to the cosine of theta times the force of tension, because it's going to be the component of tension. Trig is going to tell me that as well if this is theta. So now, just like I use sine up here, I know that the cosine of theta equals opposite over hypotenuse. Well, I just called the opposite this. So FTY is really equal to the opposite, which is going to be the square root of L squared minus R squared, over the hypotenuse L times this force of tension. So we just showed that FTY, this is really an expression for FTY. Now, student made the claim that FTY was less than mg, but we see that's not correct. We see right here that in fact, FTY is equal to mg. A student uh, the student observes that radius r increases as v of the sphere increases. Together, they derive this equation right here to calculate the radius, regardless of whether this is incorrect or correct. So here's an example of where it does not matter if it's correct or incorrect, unlike the last one. Does it plausibly model the student's observation in relationship between r and v? Well, yes. We know that L over g, the square root of that, is a constant. So if we look at this relationship, r equals v times some constant, as r goes up, V is going to go up. So it does plausibly model the students, and that's why. In this equation, does it correctly model the relationship between R and V if V is very fast? Well, no. And why? Because there are constraints of L. R can only be as big as L. Therefore, V can only increase until R equals L. So now it says they're going to switch it up. Instead of a horizontal circle, now it's going to be moving in the vertical plane as a simple pendulum. Okay, a simple pendulum we know follows simple harmonic motion. The maximum angle that strikes the vertical is assumed to be very small. When they say assumed to be very small, that's a special condition where I could say that the sine of this theta really is just equal to theta. Okay, that's what they mean by assumed to be small. It's just a little relationship for a pendulum you need to know. The graph below shows the data, so there's going to be a graph of uh, period and the length of the string. So let's take a look at that graph. Fantastic. It's T squared over L. And guys, if you're curious why they squared that, I'll just add this in real quick. The, the period of a pendulum is equal to 2 pi L over G. So you can see these are not a direct relationship, but if I square it, T P squared equals 4 pi squared L over G. You can now see that these have a direct relationship so I can get that nice linear graph that I want. And if I set this up as y equals mx plus b, we see this is the y value. This right here is going to be the m value and then l is going to be the x value plus a constant, which is really just zero. So now we have this representing the slope. So the slope itself right here is really four pi squared over g. That's gonna be the relationship here. 
So explain how the graph above would change under the following uh, circumstances. Justify your answer. Uh, the mass were increased. No change in slope. Make sure you justify your answer. Mass is not in the formula. That's simple as that. What's the maximum angle? Same. No change. In slope, theta is not in the period formula. Ooh, now we go to the moon. Okay, so what's the condition of the moon? The moon means G, moon, is just going to be less than G, Earth. Okay, that's just something that we know. All right, so now we look at the slope. What's going to happen as G goes down? What happens to the period? It goes up at, for any given L. So when I relate this and this, if L, at, for any given L, as G is down smaller, T is going to go up. So the slope is going to increase. So the slope is just going to get steeper. Now the period is going to increase at a greater rate. So the graph will still be linear. There'll still be a relationship here, but G is going to affect the slope. So the pendulum is taken to the moon. Uh, they want to know how the graph would change. The slope would stay linear and get steeper. Here we have the graph of this. The graph shows angle theta. So this is really a position versus time graph, right? So X versus T graph. That's really what we're looking at. Explain how the graph shows evidence that there's a net force acting and how this net force. So don't forget about this, how this net force is a restoring force. Well, we know that the slope of a position versus time graph is velocity. So here, I just look at these relationships. Velocity is changing. If velocity is changing, acceleration is present. Acceleration is greater than zero when velocity is changing. And for there to be an acceleration, must be caused by an F net. Okay, so that's the evidence that there's an F net present, right? The velocity is changing, which means the acceleration is greater than zero meters per second squared. So therefore, the acceleration must be caused by some F net. How does this show that there is a that this is a restoring force? I think the two ways. Let's see the two ways that I would really explain that. Well, first, I would say in simple harmonic motion, a restoring force is always present. And then I would kind of describe what a restoring force is. And since a restoring force wants to bring an object back to equilibrium, that's the definition of restoring force. We can see that in the graph by looking at the velocities. So as it approaches zero, it goes past zero, but then it slows. So V slows. So that means there is a force that's trying to push it back to zero. But then when it gets to here, the F net accelerates it and accelerates, accelerates. So now V increases back to zero. So it wants it to be zero. But then what happens when it gets to zero again? Now it's going to slow back to zero. So we see this as it's coming towards a zero part, speed is increasing and speed is increasing as I go. But as I head away from zero, speed slows. So all the force wants to do is accelerate it towards zero and decelerate it back towards zero as well. So that's kind of the evidence that there is a net force that's causing a restoring force. Okay, so we finally made it. The sphere swings back and forth. It also rotates. Now, guys, I don't think that means that this is free to spin. I think what it means is if we look at a point, it goes from here, then it comes up to here, so we see it actually rotated, it's rotating this way. And as I come this way, a point here, rotate, but they want it in reference of this point here. So this point is actually rotating. And we know that rotation has to be call, caused by some torque, so that's probably what they're gonna ask about, hold on. In order for the sphere's rotation to change, a torque yep, must be applied to the sphere where the sphere is at maximum right position. So they're gonna be looking at this position over here. I'm just gonna draw it so I can kinda see where there's a torque. Is a maximum right displacement, what is the direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, that the torque exerted on the sphere with respect to the point of attachment? So here is the point of attachment. So this is where the force of tension acts, right here on the edge. We also know that gravity is going to point down from the center of mass. This is going to cause the torque. Now a torque is some force that causes rotation at some r. Well, where's the R? The R is right here. Here's the point of attachment, the pivot point, and that pivot point is chosen because that's what they asked me to do. They said, um, in respect to the point of attachment, so that's what I'm using as my pivot. So here's my little R. So FG causes a little R, which is going to make this object spin in a clockwise 
direction. Guys, I hope this explanation helped. If it did, please give the video a thumbs up so it tells YouTube so that other people want to watch it. If you have any questions or I made any mistakes, just leave them down in the comments below and we'll address those as they come up. Until I see you guys on the next ones, guys, stay positive, work really, really hard, always be kind to other people. I'll catch you on the next one. Have a great day.